Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you had an enjoyable lunch. My name is Noshiba Degani, and I'm the Chief of Quality and System Performance at Canadian Mental Health Association, Ontario Division. It's my pleasure to be the moderator for our next keynote. For this session, please pose your questions in the Q&A box to the right of the screen and vote for the questions that you would like to see asked. It will upvote those questions. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Carrie Gladue was born and raised in Edmonton, Alberta. He's an intergenerational survivor of the residential school system, as well as a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. After spending most of his life in and out of the system and the death of his mother and sister, Carrie woke up in a jail cell. Broken and alone, he cried out in, in his cell for a second chance. Carrie arrived in Calgary as a participant in the Calgary Drug Treatment Court program. After being advised he would be spending the next 11 years in prison, he was given a second chance. Now, over 11 years clean and sober, Carrie's dedication and commitment to others has been instrumental in the recovery of almost 2,000 clients he has served. Carrie is now the Director of Indigenous Relations and Client Services and was also instrumental in the creation of Simon House Recovery Center's Indigenous Programming, as well as an Indigenous Family Reunification Program. Carrie is also a published author, actor, and dedicates his story and experiences to helping others achieve healing and change. Please welcome Carrie Gladue. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Shaganapi. My English name is Carrie Gladue. Uh, and as mentioned, I'm from uh, Alberta, Edmonton. I always start off a little earlier. I kind of start off before me and how I came to be. My mom was raised in a residential school in uh, Gruard, Alberta called St. Bernard's Mission. Uh, she was taken when she was about two and a half years old. Don't, didn't know much of uh, about the residential school system. My mom kind of refused to talk about it. She let out little things growing up, but we never really understand it. I'm the oldest of uh, three three children, uh, and I have one brother left, uh, lost a sister to addiction. So growing up, you know, it was, you know, and learning about this stuff in my later years in sobriety, it was pretty heart heartening to also, you know, acknowledge the stuff I put my mom through, being a survivor of the residential school system. You know, up to her passing, probably within about a, you know, a months before she, taking the opportunity to take his kids up to Gruart, which she hadn't been in since she was a little kid, and share a little bit of our, her journey with us. Uh, at that time, I was a full-blown, uh, you know, I was addicted to crack, cocaine, alcohol, so I didn't absorb any of that at the time. And, and what it meant, you know, not like I do today. Uh, my mom left the, you know, when she was in there, she'd met some people. Uh, she grew up with a few people we got to know as aunties because we never knew any relatives growing up. When I researched my, you know, I was writing my book, Second Chances, I did a lot of research on it and I had a lot of people reach out to me that knew my mom back then and, and told me a bunch of stuff about, about her that I would have never known, you know, even some family history that I found out. Uh, my my band would have been uh, the Papa's Chase Band, number one thirty six in Edmonton, Alberta. My ancestors there were were uh, starved in, into submission for their land to make way for Edmonton and CP Rail coming through, and they were dismembered out to the local reserves all across the province and beyond. So, I have lots of relatives out, out there as a glad you that uh, you know I'm still finding out to this day, in my later years. Uh, again, researched my book more about my mom, you know, she, when they closed down in 1961, that residential school, my mom was sent to mental health facilities, Pinoca. She was locked up uh, for a form of psychosis due to all the trauma that she'd had in that residential school. Uh, my mom shared it through records that I've witnessed uh, raped by priests uh every weekend the priest would say mass and he would take my mom and rape her in the vehicle off the property uh 
my mom would never share stuff like that. And, and my mom wasn't alive to hear what, you know, those those secrets and stories that that finally came out when those two first 250 and kid came out. So I kind of wish she was around for that. But, you know, in a way, I think she, she knows, right? She was there. My mom left the center there. She uh, went to several foster homes after, you know, she was in the mental health institutions for the trauma she received. Uh, her record stated that she was just a brown little uh, Indian girl all alone in the world and she had nobody. And that's how my mom grew up with nobody, right? Uh, at about 16 years old, she was impregnated by an RCMP officer and he left her with that baby. And he went off to another post somewhere in Canada. So I have a brother out there named Daryl. That's the only name that she knew at the time. And I've never met an older brother. That was my mom's firstborn. My mom met my dad in a, in a dance in Edmonton. And uh, they fell in love. He was a another Métis man. And he used to paint. And I remember, you know, as a young child, maybe five years old, our our living room full of canvases and really nice paintings and he was always painting and he would leave i guess that's how he made the money to bring home is because he'd take those paintings and he'd sell them all over the place and he you know when he did come home he would uh he would bring some money and food and stuff but i don't remember the food stuff or the you know the bringing the stuff but what i do remember is he'd come home and uh He'd come home drunk all the time, and he'd be hitting my mom and and beating her up. And on one occasion, I remember uh, very clearly as me, my brother, and sister, we were all huddled in my mom's bed together. We had a bath, and and she put us those little onesies, those plastic, you know, they have little booties, and all the onesie. We all had onesies, and you hear banging on the door, and and um. My mom would say, don't say anything, your dad's home, and we'd get all scared. And then she'd take us in the basement and hide us under the cellar stairs because uh, he'd be coming looking for her, right? On this occasion, too, he re he opened up the, 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 the door in the basement there, and I remember uh, him pulling her out by the hair and kicking her in the head and uh, dragging her up the stairs. and. I remember you know, us kids having blood all over us because we were pulling her legs down the stairs as he was pulling her up and he would just beat her up and and then uh it was just like a never-ending cycle right and he'd be gone for a while and he'd be back he'd be gone it was you know i remember that very you know vividly and that was that was my biological father growing up one time my mom uh, she brought home this uh big German Shepherd dog. I don't know where she got it. And uh, his name was King and she'd park it right in front of our door. And it, that dog just loved my mom. My mom just looked after it really well. And uh, he, it blocked the door. So when my, my dad came home, he wouldn't let him in. So what happened there is, you know, my dad was out of the picture, my biological dad after that. And uh, I think he would go for milk or something or cigarettes and he would never come back for a long time. So finally he was out of the picture. My mom was going out quite a bit and she was bringing different men home and, and stuff like that. I didn't know at the time that my mom was, you know, she was soliciting herself to make money for, for us. I remember she would come home. She wouldn't come home drunk or, or high all the time either. You know, I remember her more times coming home with food and uh you know, food for the house for us kids, some clothes, and, you know, just to look after her. So that's, you know, she didn't really have any residential schools, didn't teach them any skills, you know, it was kind of like slave labor. And that and education, you know, there's no really teachers there to educate them on anything. So she didn't really have the skills to be out in the work world, especially being a, you know, a Native woman, you know, in a, in a in the city of Edmonton, right? So, uh, one time she came home with this guy and he had the sideburns and he had a suit on and he used to play uh, Elvis tunes and he used to play the guitar and he was treating my mom really good, eh? He was treating her really nice and he'd give us kids a quarter. You know, back in the mid-70s, a quarter, well, you know, for anyone listening out there, I can get you a lot. And he even had change left over after buying a pop of chips and stuff, right? 
So he would do that to us, and he'd take mom out to dinner. He'd, he'd dress up and stuff like that, right? So after that, you know, that went on for a very short, it was short-lived, right? And then he started, you know, my mom used to be sing a lot. She had a really good voice, and she used to sing it at the parties. There'd be parties in our place all the time. You know, as kids would be told, get in the basement, get in the basement, you know? And uh, the party would be going, then we'd hear screaming, and then we'd hear fighting, and then, you know, we'd sneak up or we'd look under the crack of the basement door, and there'd be blood all over the floors, and people passed out everywhere. This fellow my mom was dating in Edmonton, he had a, he had a cousin that was a city police officer, and and every time the police came there, he was the guy that showed up. He'd go in there and he'd go in the bedroom and he'd, he'd have a beer. Uh, he'd be smoking pot with, with, with his cousin, my mom's boyfriend at the time. That's Bill. In my book, for whoever buys the book, that's Bill. And then, you know, I remember one time looking out, we had a, a cop car parked on our front lawn. And the cop was passed out on our couch in uniform, just laid right out. So growing up, you know, I didn't really have the authority to understand the authority. I didn't have much respect for it in the way that most people would. You know, that was my understanding because I got to see a different side of it. So, you know, one occasion, my mom, she, my mom was stabbed once in our, like one of these parties too. And when she was stabbed in the back, uh, some woman stabbed her there and, in her house. And we were, us kids were downstairs and we were crying, always crying for my mom. I was, you know, even talking about now it's a lonely feeling because mom's no longer here. But, uh, you know, we were crying for her and, and Bill would slam the door. We'd be locked in this basement. Now, me and my brother, we slept on a mattress. It was like a dungeon, right? And you go down some old wooden stairs and it was, you know, broken concrete floor. It was damp. We had a mattress on the floor that me and my brother slept on. I remember waking up, we were floating one time. It was flooded down there. Nobody did anything to help us. And, and we were told, get up, get to school, you little brats, and stuff like that. And that's what we had to do. No, Nothing to eat or anything. We'd have to go to school. So school was a very struggle, a very hard struggle for us kids growing up because we had no stability, no routine or anything like that. It was always survival from a very young age. And that's all we learned, and that's all I knew all, most of my life, right? So mom, you know, mom made it through that. She lived. She almost died. And uh, she was home again. And then, you know, another instance I heard, you know, I heard, we heard scream and I heard a window smash and I heard, you're going to kill me. You're going to kill me. And then all of a sudden, you know, a window smashed. Now me and my brother, we had a little tiny square window in the basement that we could fit out if we broke the glass. This was like January feather or February weather. It was like minus thirty. You know, we were we were in like pajamas, if that. And we try to crawl out that window. Nobody would let us out of the basement. If there was a fire, we'd all be dead. And uh, he, we got out to the, we made out to the crack of the, you know, there's a dugout out of the window. We made it out got out of the snow, crawled out. We met my mom on the street. My mom was pitch naked, pouring blood from, she had to jump through the window. This guy, Bill, was beating her with a, a old Electrolux vacuum pipe. Through the, that, and he almost killed her. And that's, she was screaming, you're gonna kill me, you're gonna kill me. We were banging on doors, you know, late at night in our neighborhood. We were the only natives in the neighborhood and nobody would let us in for blocks. And, uh, my school, you know, the school that we went to was right across the street, like from the house, maybe, you know, 50 feet or across the street was my school classroom window. So all the kids knew what was going on. The school knew what was going on at the house, right? So it was pretty embarrassing when I did get a chance to go to school is, is to go in there and always have people talking about me, right? Didn't have much, you know, friends there or anything like that. I didn't really have any friends uh, at all because I ran away all the time. Uh, just kind of jumping back to, you know, what happened to my mom there that on a, many occasions, but that's one that I really sticks to me. Some people let us in, and we were able to call an ambulance, and and the police came again, and who else, who came? Just 
Bill's cousin. So nothing happened to Bill again. And, you know, we ended up going to a shelter. I think we went to a church and, and we, we, uh, we've been to a few churches and we sleep in, you know, on the pews or we sleep on the floor. They give us blankets. And then my mom would always find a place for us to stay. It was always short lived because she'd always go back to him too. Right. We went on to nine years of this stuff. Right. There was always the booze and the drinking. So that was, you know, I always wondered, you know, I wanted something different and, you know, I wanted to feel older and fit in. So I started stealing the booze when they were passed out, start stealing beer. Sometimes they would give us drinks, you know, give us a drink of whiskey and watch us go crazy. Uh, I'd find pot in the bathroom for people smoking up. I'd find pills laying all over. We'd just take one, not even knowing what it was, you know, about eight, eight years old. And uh, my mom would, uh, you know, she'd always go back to this fella and, and it'd be the same thing. We started getting apprehended by, so you know, social service. We weren't going to school. I think, you know, we would get, I think a lot of times too, I know that this bill would try to get us apprehended because we weren't his kids, eh? And he wanted to have a kid with my mom, but he he would play nice with us, but he wasn't nice at all, right? He'd punch me in the face and he'd give me black eyes. I had fat lip, you know, you know, eight to 10 years old. I remember that. And I used to go to the park all the time and I'd, I'd tell my mom would come back and she'd go, what happened to you? She goes, who did that? I'd say, well, I was fighting in the park. I didn't want to tell her that it was Bill doing it because what would happen is he would, she'd get mad at him and that fight would start. And my mom would get beat up. So I kept all those all those bruises and that to myself you know, all the time, right? To try to keep that from happening. You know, one at another party, you know, again, one of thousands of parties. That's all that I remember that life. I don't, you know, when I think about, well, you must have some good memories, Carrie. And I think, I can't really think of any <laughs> to this day. You know, it seems kind of gloomy back then. But uh, every time I share this, like right now, I'm kind of vibrating a little bit, you know, because it never goes away. Uh, those feelings and those experiences like that, I guess you just, you know, me personally, by talking about it helps me and uh, it helps me heal a little more all the time, right? One day uh, there was screaming coming from the living or the hallway of our little tiny house in Edmonton and, and I heard a phone, those old rotary phones, those old heavy ones, and my mom took this phone and she clocked Bill right in the head with it, knocked him out in the bathtub. There's blood everywhere. Like, I tell you, uh, for little kids, I don't think we can see how much of that kind of stuff we've seen blood. You know, I'm glad my daughter never gets to see that stuff. And we were excited. I was actually happy. And then I got scared really quick. She knocked this guy out that's been tormenting us and beating us up for nine years. And then I thought, oh, he's going to kill her, right? And this was a constant worry, right, of my mom being killed and murdered by this guy. It was always there for me, you know. And I try to run away, and I try to take these pills, and I try to drink as much as I can. I would take off. I'd never go to school, you know, just to get away. I go, you know, I go sleep in parks, you know, nine, ten years old. I'd, I'd take off all over the province of Alberta, stealing vehicles. Uh, so my, my, my criminal stuff started quite young. I think it was the Juvenile Juvenile Delinquents Act back then or something. It was way before the Young Offenders or Young Offenders Act started. And, uh, you know, I started meeting different kind of people in the same kind of life. So I was kind of like we were attracted to each other. Uh, I got into, you know, sniffing model airplane glue, sniffing gasoline out of little kids. You know, it, it would just... It would take me away from reality of what was really happening, right? And of course, at the time, the reality that I was trying to get away from was just my life. It was normal, right? That's what I knew as normal. You know, if people were to say, well, wouldn't you like to be around normal people in normal life? I would, my answer at that time would be, I am around normal people. What are you talking about, right? In and out of foster homes, uh, my first time, you know, I, I was in, locked up in a place in Edmonton and they locked you up in there and, and uh, I remember I peed my pants I woke up in a with a line full of beds in a wall with kids and I stayed there I was scared to come out of the bed because I you know I was so scared I peed my pants and 
I didn't want no one to know. And I was, you know, I was crying for my mom and I was crying for my brother. Me and my brother were really close. My little sister, Selena, never got taken away at all. You know, she was kind of babied by Bill a lot as a girl. I don't know why, but, you know, she slept upstairs in this house. She had her own room. She had a princess bed. She had everything she wanted. And, and you know, me and my brother was quite the opposite. But I'm thankful she didn't have to go through as much. But she did experience a lot of stuff with us too, right? Waking up in these different plate foster homes, that was my first incident. And uh, every time I went in, I get locked up. We never were explained why. And again, I always thought because mom was dead now, right? This was it. And we had nobody. And then, I, you know, I'd be crying for my brother, my younger brother, because that's how close we were. And uh, then I get out, get picked up. We get back at home again, same, same stuff going on. You know, I'm, I'm about 12 years old now. Bill's not in the, in the, in the picture anymore. He's gone. Uh, that knock with the telephone, you know, she, she should have did that earlier, I thought, at the time. Because uh, he was no longer in the picture, right? She finally stood up to herself. and But the parties never stopped. The drugs never stopped. You know, the pills. My mom was a chronic pill taker, you know. Uh, like age eight years old, here's one instance here, too. My mom was crying for him, right? And I'm thinking, how could you cry for this guy? He's a monster, right? He keeps hitting us and hurting you. And, you know, we had no food. We're, we're sharing a, a loaf of bread and taking little pieces of bread, trying to make it last. But my mom gets her next check, right? Because they drank it all up. And uh, she goes, my boy, go go in the bathroom. And uh, there's a little tiny box there in the cabinet, medicine cabinet. Grab that for mom. So I said, okay, mom, you know, she was just crying in that, right? My sister was long braided picky tail. She's hugging mom. My brother's trying to comfort mom. And I said, now here's me. I'm, I'll get it, mom. So I climbed up on the, to on the toilet. I was just a little guy, right? Climbed up on the sink, stood there, and I opened up the cabinet. And I, oh, there it is. It's a little white little box, plastic thing. I went and ran over. Here, here you go, mom. This is for you. And, uh. She looked at it, she opened it up, she took out her slick razor blade and almost cut her hand off. She sliced her wrist, there's blood all over us, spraying us, and and we, we knew how to call, you know, 911 at a very young age, right? Uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, we've seen, right? And, you know, something, you know, with the suicide, and that's something that I ended up following in my life, in my teenage years, right, after, after what I'm going to share next. Uh, one day, my my brother, you know, uh, my brother and me were taken away, and I was wasn't permitted to see my brother. You know, I could have handled not being around, you know, the family if I had to be. But me and my brother, it was something. We were closer than anything, right? And I wasn't allowed to be with him because we were always running away, and uh, we never really said what was going on because we didn't think, you know, they must know anyway, right? Uh, but we'd run and we'd run and we'd run and we'd sniff glue. We'd, you know, wake sleeping and, you know, we get caught in people's cars. We weren't stealing, actually. We were sleeping in there because we had no place to go. And, and, you know, people's garages and that's, that's where our hiding out places. And we'd go into old homes that were for sale with a for sale sign, crawl in the window and, and we'd make believe, you know, that, you know, we, this was our home. You know, we had a, it was a beautiful home that we'd never, we've only seen on TV and that we'd stay in it. And then we'd, when people would come there, the real estate, we'd run out the window and we'd take off, right? And we'd go to another place. We'd go to McDonald's garbages and we'd, we'd open up the top and no one was looking and we'd, we'd eat half eat hamburgers and some French fries. And, and then we'd start off in the bushes and eat it. And that's how we ate. Or we'd go into pizza places and we'd kind of watch and go to the bathroom and we'd see someone leave their meal. We'd sit down uh, as they left after paying and we'd start eating it, right? So we kind of got some little skills growing up as little little rascals and, and you know, again, just surviving, right? So we got taken and uh, I was placed in a place called uh, Westfield in Edmonton. Uh, I think it's called the Yellowhead Youth Center nowadays. And during that time, you know, I was told I was only going to be there for a little while. Uh, you know, again, you know, there's some stuff going on. Mommy needs help, you know, stuff like that. And, so, okay, we're already used to it. I've been there lots already, but 
this place was different. It was like a big institution. There's units, there's cottages, it's all big property. And I think at that time it was it was my first uh although I didn't like it, it was my first experience at some structure and some stability, right? Uh no one likes to be locked up in, in foster homes and stuff like that. Not everyone had a, has a good experience, as I'll also share later. Uh, but I did get some stability there. I got some, you know, a little more healthy. I had, you know, food, had clothing. I was going to school now, and I kind of liked that, right? And uh, I did. I didn't really know anything about that. And you know, later on in life, you learn, like in my own, in my recovery, my sobriety, and learning about this stuff. Just imagine what someone can do, you know, or where I would actually be today if I had that stability and a good home and a good environment, right? And a good community, which, which. You no, know, wasn't around at that time right now. I don't have an opportunity for. I'm in this place now for going on three years. No contact with my mom. I'm running away. Uh, uh, I'm about uh, 10, 11 years old, and uh, we ran out of the winds. This There's a night staff on at this place, and we a couple of us made a pact that, okay, 12 o'clock bump, Comes, we're going to run out of our dorms and we're going to run out the main door and we're just going to run and split up. And there's only one staff on and only one of us might get caught. So that's our thinking. We're already thinking of this stuff and scheming at that age. So I got away for quite a while. I made it up to Lac La Biche. And I don't know why, you know, I always wanted to go up to Lac La Biche area and stuff like that. And I didn't know that that's where my some of my ancestors were. I, had, I have relatives all over there I'm still learning about, right? And, and maybe there's a link there, a spiritual link. But I ended up up there. Uh, we'd sit around there and, you know, we'd go by. There's, I remember old train tracks and we'd go around there and, and drink, you know, some wine with the, the homeless people and they'd roll some cigarettes for us. We'd uh, break into, we started breaking into houses at that time. And I, you know, I don't remember taking anything, but I remember going for the fridge lots and trying to get some food, right? Uh, and then one day, you know, we're in, we're in an Aklabish in the winter time. And, uh, I remember the RCMP driving by one day. We'd always kind of pretend we fit in that we had parents and stuff. We used to sleep in the laundry mat there at nighttime too, right? It was always open. We hide in between the machines. And then one time this cop just picked us up. He started asking some questions and we, we didn't make the answers for him. And, uh, he ended up going back to the center. You know? It was a revolving door for me because as soon as they'd bring me back, I was, I'd run again. I'd get the bug lotion, the, you know, the, the lice treatment, my clothes change. They would hide my clothes. They would lock me up in the center. And I'd still find a way out, right? And uh, I'd do the same thing over again. And then one day I got a call that, you know, your mom, your mom's been meeting with the social workers and we might be working on bringing you home. And I'm like, what are you talking about, my mom? My mom's dead. I said, no, she's not. I said, what do you mean she's not? You guys never even told me that. You know, so I thought my mom, that's why I was at this place. So, you know, long story short, I ended up back home again. My mom wasn't with that bill anymore still. Uh, and she worked on getting us back, right? Uh, Mom's had a lot of, like, mental health stuff going on, a lot of, lots of depression, I'm telling you. She was always on medication, always taking pills, and she'd take pills and drink, right? Now, here's me. I'm like, what was I, 12 or 13 years old now? I'm the man of the house. I'm the oldest. Bill's not there. No one's there to beat me up. No one's mom's not going to tell me to go to school or, or to do anything now, right? Uh, I'm drinking with my mom. I'm smoking cigarettes. Uh, I'm fighting with everybody. I had, you know, I'm fighting with kids in the neighborhood. I'm, I don't care. I'm fighting with my brother and sister. I'm not listening or doing anything. Police are coming around lots for me. I'm getting into crime, you know, not probably more fighting crime at that time. And uh, one day I walked in the door and my mom was just crying. She was sitting there. She goes, my boy, she goes, I need a break from you. I can't handle you anymore. And I said, Mom, what are you talking about? She goes, I got someone coming to pick you up. You're going to go away for a little bit, okay? A couple of weeks, maybe. Mom needs a break. And I'm like, Mom, I ain't going anywhere. So I went out the back door, and the social worker come up, up in the door at the same time, and they blocked me in there. 
So I sat at the kitchen table and I was just crying, right? And uh, I was like, you know, what do you mean a couple? I just got out. I just did three years. You know, what do you mean you need another two weeks or whatever? And then the worker starts saying, here, you like, do you like camping? Do you like doing, you know, fishing and stuff like that? Let's give your mom a break. I I'm, I'm can sure you I'll take take you to a safe, a good place. You know, there's other boys there. You'll have fun and, and then we'll bring you back and stuff like that. And I'm like, you know, this went on for a little while. You know, I'm crying. My mom's just bawling. Out and and finally I said, okay, I can do a couple, you know, weeks. You know, I just did three years. I can do a couple weeks. So I went with a social worker and she took me to a group home. Uh, this is the social services in Edmonton. And I went to this group home and it was a nice looking place. And, you know, nice neighborhood, quiet, kind of like, you know, kind of scary at the same time, but, you know, kind of fascinated a bit and interested. So I went and brought into the front door and there's an older man there, probably, you know, just an older man there balding and introduced himself and they introduced me to some other boys there around my age. And then uh, the worker and him went talking and then and then uh, she left. She goes, well, I'll be in touch with you. Well, you know, we're going to help mom and stuff, whatever. And, you know, and then the guy says, the worker, the, the worker in this place says, yeah, you'll be fine here and we'll get you settled in. So she left. He, he, Took me, showed me. I had my own room, I had my own room, and it was pretty cool. I had my own bed, and it wasn't in the basement. And you know, we had supper. We had it was like Christmas meal, just normal everyday meal to normal people. It was like Christmas. We had meat, potatoes, vegetables, milk, you know, stuff like that. I had no clothes and or stuff like that. And he was, he said, "Well, we'll see if we can get you some clothes." I think they gave vouchers or something back then. So I was there for maybe you know couple of weeks go by and that and you know th this guy asked me he says you know the, the worker this old guy he says hey i usually give massages you know you want a massage it'll help you sleep you look a little tense i'm like what's a massage and then the other boys kind of looked they looked at me and they kind of left the room and, then, and i says okay so you know a little while later he, you know this guy started i'm just gonna get right down he started molesting me the social worker in there and uh I remember just, I remember, what are you doing? I, I got up, I ran to that room, that was my room. I took this old dresser and I pushed it against the door. I was crying, I want my mom, you know. Uh, you know, I, I was just, I didn't know what was happening to me, right? And and then he pushed his way in the room. And no, those other boys, I don't know where they were, right? Because our rooms are right by each other. And he says, shut up who's gonna believe someone like you he says keep your mouth shut and you'll get some clothes you'll get some stuff here and uh uh you say anything no one's gonna believe you and i said i'm telling on you he says well we'll see what happens right try it i'm going back now to okay here's another one you know someone that's supposed to be a good person authority i remember the cop that's always visiting when my mom's getting beat up and you know all this stuff and i'm thinking well this is normal too right so I quite got really quiet. Uh, I think after that, I was really quiet. You know, I was pretty outgoing, you know, little guy, you know, more talkative and stuff like that. But things changed for me after that, right? I felt really ashamed. I felt dirty, uh, alone, scared, uh, unbelieved, uh, and stuck, right? This guy did this to me probably every second, third night since I was there. I was asked in, in treatment when I was 41 years old, and I started sharing this, you know, coming out with this stuff in, more in public and with my name to it. And, and how long were you in that place, Carrie? People would say, I'd say 30-something years. They said, but you weren't there that long. I said, I'm still living with it, you know? And, and that was the experience of that. I got into that. I, you know, I got into serious crime after that. I started doing actually doing crime after that. I started uh, breaking into homes, not caring. I was, you know, 14, 15 years old. I'm downing alcohol, whiskey out of the bottle straight. I'm taking pills, you know, 
to the point where I'm, I don't even care if I overdose. That stuff didn't mean nothing. I just go and I'd wake up, passed out, you know, under trees and stuff like that, and, and I just do it again and again. I started visiting, you know, uh, young offender centers in and out, in and out. It was like a revolving door for me. I get closed custody, open custody. It was just back and forth, and uh, you know, I, I I met this girl drinking of course and you know i really liked her and we settled down it's probably kind of like my first love and uh we had we had kids you know we had some we had four kids all together and we drank together all the time we ended up losing our kids uh you know what we we're doing is it's that same thing our parents did right so the stuff that you know when i held my first little my firstborn and said, you know, you'll never have to go through stuff like that. Well, he did, you know, all of them did. I, uh, <clears throat> this girl that I'm talking about, she, she overdosed, uh, you know, a few years before I came into treatment. And, uh, well, but my kids are older. I have some relationships with those ones to this day and some just don't like me anymore. They, they, you know, they always remember me as a person back then. So it's not, it's a, it's a work in progress always, right? Some got addiction issues. Uh, some I've tried to help as well. Uh, I went on to have four more kids after, you know, um, my first time in the federal penitentiary, uh, I got out, things are going to be changed. You know, when I was in Drumheller penitentiary, I, uh, I got my, first kind of experience with you know some in sweats and smudging and stuff like that when i was 19 years old uh, my first time in and and uh it was quite the experience right and i started hanging out i hung around with the lifers in there and uh you know the guys i know that's been in there for you know 15 years you know at a young age you kind of wonder you know consider this when i first got into drum <clears throat> My brother was already there, right? I didn't know he was there, but somebody put a chocolate bar. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, it was quite experienced. Uh -oh. It was uh, quite an experience for me. It was, it was being in a different world where, <clears throat> where at that time, I realized that some of these people may never get out of here. And they're okay with that. They show they're okay with that. And then I've seen a lot of people that if they had another chance, I'm, I bet you they would make the best of it, and they weren't getting another chance. Uh, so I started kind of helping people in there. I got, you know, part of the Native Brotherhood. I got voted in. You know, I'm just a young guy, and I started organizing, fun organizing functions in there at the time. And I ended up getting a parole pretty quick for that because it was the first time in and stuff too, right? I didn't understand all that stuff. I went to programs. I worked. I kept busy. Had a few close calls in there with some people, of course, but uh, made it through. And the, the old timers in there told me, they said, you know, when you leave this place, you call out, when you've got gate closes, you look back and you call your spirit three times. Don't leave your spirit in there. Don't leave it in there. You'll be back, right? So I did that. Uh, I got out. My my ex from my first kids was drinking lots. Uh, she was doing all kinds of stuff. She was in her own little, uh, having her problems too. And uh, at that time, and I moved on. I got into driving tow trucks. I'd, I'd always had this thing about I get some stability for a while. I was able to do some things, you know, driving tow truck. You know, uh, was an experience. It was fast paced, multitasking, uh, something I was good at. And then uh, I'd start drinking again, or I'd start, you know, doing the drugs. And then I, I'd, I'd have to, you know, I'd, I never got fired. I just quit, right? And then I met this girl in the bar. 
and I ended up having uh, four more kids with her, right? We got married. That was the first time I got married. We were together almost 10 years. Uh, and we went through a bunch of heartache and addiction issues. Uh, again, lost some of our kids. I had my mom there to help out a lot. My mom uh, went on to, you know, stop using, stop drinking. And what my mom was doing now is she was taking care of the grandkids, right? And it was kind of like her second chance, not with us, but with our kids. I'm going to just fast forward a little bit here. I'm going on now. I'm, I'm an adult now, and I'm, I'm a full-blown crystal meth addict. I'm doing all kinds of crime now. Or, well, they said it was organized crime. I was a counterfeiter. Uh, when I did the crystal meth, I don't know what it did to me, but, you know, I thought I was invincible. I, I, I thought I, I got extra creative. I was making currency, and I was cashing it everywhere. and and meeting the wrong kind of people, scary people. I'd be in basements for weeks, making money for people and uh, identifications. And uh, it was somewhere where I was trapped. It was like seven years to the last part of my addiction. I was on the street. I was homeless, you know, sleeping everywhere, making money and for other people more or less. And when I'd have money, you know, I was getting used a lot out there by people. Uh, and then my mom gave me a call one time on the phone as I was surrounded by the RCMP. And she said, my boy, you need to come home. And I'm like, what do you mean, mom? She goes, I, I said, I think I'm going to jail right now. I was surrounded by the RCMP at that time. And they were waiting for somebody, a warrant or something. So I said, I think I'm about to go to jail. Anyway, I didn't get surrounded, by, but I did make it home to Edmonton at the time. And my mom took me out on the front porch and said, come have a cigarette with me, my boy. So I went down and she says, you know, mom's been sick. I says, I know, mom, what's, you know, you went to the doctor. What's wrong with you, right? Because she was sleeping all the time and she wasn't feeling good. Eh? She goes, I got 60 days to live. And I actually swear, I said, mom, don't have him say that. You've been telling me, you know, I've been watching you die all your life, you know. Don't tell me that. You've been doing good. You've been sober. She goes, I got cancer, she says. And, you know, it was... uh. It was a hard thing, right? That's the only person in her life. And I didn't really believe her. But the next day, she had to get a kidney out. She had to get all this stuff. I said, Mom, I'm really sick. I don't think I'm going to be you know, around too long either. She goes, you got to, you know, when are you going to see the light, she says, right? So I went out. You know, I was in and out. I was, you know, doing crime. I was doing all kinds of stuff. I would drop money off to my mom. My brother was home. He was doing really good. He was, you know, caring for my mom. We had a hospital bed, moved into my mom's living room. And uh, and uh, that's where she passed away. You know, when she passed away, I was 10 minutes away when I got the call. And when I walked in, her body was still on the on the uh, bed. And I hugged her. I closed her eyes because they were still open. And I said, Mom, the only thing I can say to her, you know, as she, she's already gone, is I'll see you soon. I left. I, I downed maybe half a pot of water ball of vodka and I took off and I went crazy again I was you know injecting all kinds of drugs in my throat and my veins and I was doing everything and then one day I just walked into the police station and I said you know long story short is that uh, I give up right I surrender I went into uh, I went into the police uh, you know I got transferred all over the province of Alberta I had over 300 charges at the time for counterfeiting and identity theft and and uh, I went down to see my lawyer in Calgary because I was shipped to Lethbridge, Calgary. I kept going back and forth. And the lawyer says, well, so what am I looking at right now? I couldn't call mom anymore. I couldn't call nobody. You know, my, my sister had just died of a drug overdose too prior to me getting arrested. So leaving me and my brother. And he says, you're looking at 11 years. I said, well, okay, I ain't going anywhere. I went up to myself. I opened up this book, which would be known as a Bible. And I opened it to any page. And I don't read the Bible. And it said, if you pray with all your heart, soul, I'll answer you. I screamed. I got on my hands and knees and I prayed, Creator, I want a second chance. Just give me a second chance, right? You know, today, you know, I've never went back to that life for over 12 years. I speak in correctional facilities. I try to help people get, you know, that relate to me to, you know, get some help. And I've been successful in a lot Lots of areas that recently I moved from director position. I now work for 
emergency homeless shelter just recently. I want to do something, you know, great firsthand with people. Uh, and I, I'm really liking it in the past, you know, months now. Uh, you know, it's hard to stuff that I, I see, but, you know, there's a lot of hope there. There's a lot of people that need second chances too. And, and I share my experience with whatever I can, right? Even though as, as somebody can tell it's hard for me to do, you know, I'm speaking for, you know, all the intergenerational survivors that, because that's what this is. Speaking for all the policy makers and decision makers out there that, you know, the, the program that I got into was the Calgary Drug Treatment Court program and it saved my life. If that program wasn't there, I would have never went to treatment. With those conditions that, you know, they laid out, I never experienced such a compassionate and at the same time stern program where you got to mingle with with the with the judges, the you know, everybody was there that actually you, you can tell they were there to help you. And my first time in that courtroom seeing a judge get down and hug a graduate, I thought, you know what, maybe I can do this too. Uh so I'm really grateful for uh for all of this stuff and for all that uh you do and continue to do there and and uh, maybe sometime in the future we'll cross paths. You know, please check out my book. Uh, you can order it through Square site, Carrie Gladue. Uh, it shares a journey. Uh, it helps people. It's used in some correctional facilities. I'd like to get it out there and a lot more across Canada if anyone knows the way. Uh, I've had a lot of people come into treatment and say, I read your book and uh, here, help me. So thank you. Thank you, Carrie, for your sharing your story with so much honesty. It's challenging to hear, and at the same time, it's really inspiring. I also want to congratulate you on your new role. They're very lucky to have you. We're now going to take questions from the audience. By way of an explanation, I'll be doing my best to combine questions that, that are similar so that we can cover as many as possible. I'll also be using upvoting to select the questions that the audience wants to pose. And so I'm going to start with a couple of the questions from the audience, Carrie. Uh, there, thank you for sharing, Carrie. You and your family have experienced so much trauma. How do you get through it? How do you forgive? I get through it a lot by, you know, I guess it would be being with healthy people, having good supports. My wife, you know, is a good support. I I have a wife that works in the same field as me. I have a six-year-old daughter now that's never seen any of this stuff. She's, you know, she goes to school every day. She, she likes her little cartoons and her crafts and her bikes and her swimming and her taekwondo. You know, she gets to do all kinds of stuff like that. My wife helps people too. She helps uh, youth as well. So, uh, I go to those supports, you know, I go to meetings, uh, I stay, it's, you know, the opposite of addiction is connection, right? So I stay connected to the healthy things, right? Where I'm comfortable. Back in the day, you'd think, uh, you know, when I share all this stuff, being around a healthy person is like gasoline and water to, to me at that time, right? Now it's the opposite. Right? I, I get this thing in my, if I, if I was to be put in a situation around unhealthiness, I would, I'm able to get out of there right away and not be part of that because it's not who I am anymore. Uh, yeah. It sounds like you're surrounding yourself with wonderful people and, and your daughter sounds lovely. Um, yeah. I, the story you're sharing is another example of the devastating impacts of intergen, intergen. Oh, oh, that's gorgeous. Thank you for sharing the that's picture. You betcha. Your story is another example of the devastating impact of intergenerational trauma on children and youth. And it's similar to what we've been hearing throughout this conference. How can service providers better understand this trauma and how, and, and how to better support individuals in the justice system? How do we break the cycle? Well, it's going to take some time to do, and it's going to take uh, everybody on board, right? Uh, I think, you know, you know, I've been working in the field for about, you know, 11, 12 years now, 11 years. And, you know, it's awareness, right? You know, a lot, you know, just acknowledging that these injustices happen is huge. And we still got a ways to go on there, a long ways to go. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, listening to the stories, you know, 
uh, of the elders and the knowledge keepers about this. That's where we're going to get the best information from listening to them. You know, what do, what do you need? You know, we've tried our ways. We've tried our ways for all these years, and we've done a lot of damage. And I think I've seen a lot of progress in that area. I see more people wanting to listen, more decision makers, justice, Paul, you know, what can we do now? We, we want to listen, you know, uh, let's make a difference. So, I, yeah, I think continuing on, even what you guys are, what we're doing right now is huge, right? Uh, I remember, you know, starting out in treatment when I was told if I wanted to smudge, I'd have to go across the street in a field, right? So you it's know, a lot different. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a lot different now. Now we've got places where, uh, you know, I, I was really blessed with, you know, where I worked at Simon House is, is I got to start an Indigenous program there and uh, a family program to work with uh, the whole families because that was a barrier, you know, having a mom and a, and a, and a, when they're together mom and the dad in treatment at the same time different centers and the kids with mom at the same time because it's a barrier right it's a family mm -hmm. if you're treating one you know a lot of times one parent can only get in and the other one's at home still using well what yeah. it's just a revolving door because you send him yeah. him or her back and it's the same thing it never ends so you get them all at once on the same journey uh so we've had some success stories there uh but yeah i've seen a lot of progress you know to date you know, I think it was those first 215 kids that came out, still thousands more that will be found. I know that. Uh, yeah. 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 They were the seeds to, uh, you know, reality and what's really happened. And it's woken up a lot of people, non Indigenous too, that I'm sure if they knew earlier, you know, they would have helped earlier. But, you know, I see a lot of people, a lot of allies, a lot of support, you know. So I, it's mm -hmm. really good for me to see and to be part of and to witness, you know, uh, people standing up for injustices uh, of, you know, Indigenous people, right? Thanks, Carrie. You talked about how drug treatment courts impacted your life positively, and the work that you do now to support others is really inspiring. How can we make sure that others have similar experiences? What do you think are the keys to success? I think uh, how the drug court worked for me personally, I'll share, I'll share on mine, is that, you know, I was in a position where, where most would try to say, hey, I'll do that if I get out of jail. It lets me out of jail. You know, and at the beginning, I guess someone would say that. And it, I would not lie, it didn't cross my path too. But it was the way the program was laid out, right? I didn't know about drug court. It was around for a little while before I came to my part where I, you know, someone, an inmate told me, an inmate told me in, in, the, in a remand center, hey, you ever hear of drug court? Like this stuff should be out, out in these centers. Uh, I get to speak every so often on a unit in the remand center, which is kind of, I go on that unit and I go talk and I talk to guys I've done time with years ago and they don't even know who I am anymore, but I share my story with them. And this unit, they start them out they screen everybody who wants to sign up to get on this unit. These are pre-trial stuff like that. Some are there for years, months, whatever it is, right? And it gives them an opportunity to start working on their treatment, start working on their recovery, start working on their mental health. They're not just locked on a unit. And, and you know, I've been in those, I grew up in jails, right? It's a zoo. It's a zoo is what it is. And not everyone's on the same, you know, start screening out people get them on these units and then what i would do is i'd come and speak to them and i open up a relationship like with calgary Rima. okay as the intake coordinator i'm the intake coordinator if you're right ready you follow what they tell you in this program here you'd be a good candidate to come to treatment so they've got all this time they're accumulating sobriety time they're starting to have their hey maybe i do want to do this maybe if these guys can do it you know we share stories of graduates that come out of remand you know, more stuff like that. Because I, when I first got to go, two years after I got done drug court, they finally allowed me in. And it was pretty hard for me because I was walking on the line. There's a line on the side of the wall where the inmates walk up with their head kind of like this. I've walked that line all my life. And I'm walking in the guard. I'm in, I got an ID tag, first time in there, plain clothes, street clothes. 
and I'm walking, and a guard who I knew is in there, and she's talking away, and she's way up ahead. She looks back, she goes, where are you? What are you doing over there? Well, I'm I'm so conditioned to walking on this line. She goes, you don't have to do that anymore. Right? Oh, my gosh. So, I, yeah, and she goes, you know your way out. I walked out of that remand center. The security let me through the doors. It was an experience, you know, and I don't have a pardon. You know, I can get one now, but for the stuff I do, I don't really need one, right? It's about it. I like to use my story to get to gay people. So drug court, the, the, having more drug courts is huge. I'm not the only yeah. success story, I'll tell you that, right? It's huge. Have them in more, get people right at that time, right? Right at that initial time. They're more, more willing, you know, to take a shot at it, right? Because people find out quite, quite quickly, it's not a get out of free jail, right? You know, I got yeah. a chance to work for drug court for two and a half years too, right? They hired me, right? I was a support worker. Yeah. And uh, it was a good, it was good for me too, because people got to see when I tell them, hey, I was in drug court, I'm a graduate. They'd be, no way, well, how are you doing this job? I said, well, I'm just doing what they taught me. I'm doing what I, they I taught think me. You're I think your story of, of being a peer, of being a, a, an advisor and the programs you're putting in place, it, it really is very inspiring. We have time for mm -hmm. one more question. Uh, and we have uh, one of the questions from the audience. Thank you for speaking your truth. I have my sage burning. I hear stories of childhood trauma as a Guadu writer all the time, unfortunately. What is one piece of advice you were given when you were young that you would pass on to those that you work with today? If I was, it'll all catch up to you, I would say, you know, it'll all catch up. You know, the actions we do back then will catch up to you later in life. You know, it's okay to ask for help. The biggest thing I would probably say is, you know, when that, when I started to get sexually abused there is tell somebody, tell somebody mm -hmm. right away. Because you know what, I, I held on to that for so long, you know, uh, that fellow there, I did walk into a police station at 27 years old because I was constantly, you know, I hung myself once. My mom found me hung, hanging. I cut my wrist, my arms are like, and I walked in there and that fella had convictions going back to the 1950s for sexually abusing children, yet he was working in childcare. When they arrested him, he was working at a boy's home, right? Jeez. I got up on that, I got up on that stand and I put him away for nine years. I never <laughs> seeked any help. I never seeked any help for it or nothing, any psychological, never was offered anything, nothing for that. And, you know, if I would have told somebody sooner, I would have been maybe a little bit when I had to go through so much. So that'd be my advice. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, so I want to just, uh, this now concludes our keynote address. This the session was powerful and emotional for me, and I expect it was for some of you as well. If you need help or support, please click the support button on the main stage to find a list of crisis services that are and resources that are available. I also encourage you to visit our poster presentations and enjoy our mindfulness session with Mike Dunn. A reminder as well to please fill out this evaluation surveys. Um, and please note the D series concurrent sessions are going to start at 3 p.m. sharp. So to attend the sessions, click on the agenda and enter your session. And once ready, click on the join button uh, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Also, there was a question in the audience about how to get where to get the book. And uh, we'll make sure that that information is available. Um, I, I know from my own personal experience, if you just search Carrie Gladue in a uh, in a search engine, it'll take you to his page and you can purchase the book directly from his web page. Um, I also, uh, again, want to thank Carrie for a, a really inspiring and uh, and honest portrayal of his life. Uh, it's it was it was uh, it was hard to hear and still so important for all of us to get a chance to to follow that session. And I hope you have a good rest of your day. <laughs>